we want to get to our uh, our guest here. We have on the line. Um, he's been a popular guest with us in the past, historian and and writer, um, William Hoagland, and he's the author of Autumn of the Black Snake and um, several other books, including a book on the Whiskey Rebellion. But the one we want to talk about today, it being the Fourth of July weekend, is when I, I guess all my books of his are kind of my favorite. But this this has a special place with me. His book is Declaration. And it's about um, the events leading up to the Declaration of Independence in 1776. So, William, can you hear us? Where are you right now? I'm in New Hampshire. I can hear you great. Okay, um, good. I'm glad to be back here. Great. Thanks you for guys. joining us. Thanks for joining us on this uh, on this holiday weekend. Uh, and um, glad. How's the, how's the book tour going for Autumn of the Black Snake? Oh, it's been fun. Uh, it's been fun. I've met with, you know, it's just different audiences in different towns. It's always interesting to see who wants to come out uh, and what kind of questions and comments they have. You know, I was in, I've been in Chicago and Dallas, uh, the two things in Dallas. That was really interesting because Texas, of course, uh, provides many, many members of the armed services of this country. And right. um, it's a little different than talking to, you know, people in Brooklyn <laughs> or maybe even in Philly, the kind of people who come out to talk to, to hear me. Uh, so I, you know, meeting with retired, you know, retired officers and so forth and having them ask questions and make comments. Is, that was great. That was great. Yeah. It's good to be, you know, get around the country and talk about these things in various contexts. Are they surprised the people, the people from the armed services or veterans out in the, in Texas and places like that, but to learn how the U S army or did they know, or they already taught all of this stuff? No, they're actually kind of surprised. Uh -huh. um, you know, the Army itself, the U.S. Army's official history traces its birth to the uh, Continental Army. Mm. And it's like a major point of my book to say that actually the Continental Army uh, disbanded and right. there was no army. And then there was a big political battle over whether there was going to be an army. And then this army was created. And, you know, um, so that that raises some issues. And that's interesting to talk about. You know, and people are really, you know, they're interested. They're interested. Right. Um so that that's kind of fun. That's cool. Because, um, yeah, the U.S. Army's history is a little different from the way uh, – the U.S. Army's official history is a little different from the way I portray it in Autumn of the Black Snake. Right. And I think everybody's received idea of the, hist of, of the Declaration of Independence and how it came about, to the extent we even kind of have an idea. I guess the general idea is um, some genteel, th uh, you know uh, – Enlightenment men in three-pointed hats gathered for tea and and wrote this kind of impassioned outrage declaration for independence because they didn't like a king. Um, and um, your history, I mean, again, what one of the things I love about this book is that your other books, you you recover really important lost episodes of early American history that no one knew about. And then, and then explain the significance of them, such as the early Indian Wars in the early 1790s. Um, you know, the 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 sort of the, the attempted coup that Hamilton and some others and the finance financiers wanted to, or threatened Washington with, um, and the whole hidden history of of finance's role in the creation of the republic, like and the Whiskey Rebellion. Those are those are episodes we don't know much about, and this is the one that everybody. I mean, if there's one date every American knows, it's July 4th, and it turns out I don't think anybody yeah. really knows the history of what led up to it. I mean, starting with the fact that as late as May 1776, so just you know less than two months before the, the Declaration of Independence, um, the idea of independence was still considered a pretty fringe, radical notion, and the, the, the most uh, popular idea, certainly among the leaders of um of the colonies at the time was sort of, we'll fight a war, but we're, we'll eventually, re there will be reconciliation. It was sort of considered, look, if you can't get what you want, you know, the legal way from, from the Brits, then you show them you're really angry by, I don't know, firing on the red coats and then, and then they'll come to an agreement. But the idea of actually independence was wacko out there. Is that right? Yeah, it, by as you say, like by uh, you know as late as May, it was it was definitely a controversial idea that the purpose of this war, which again and again, just a reminder that the war, you know, officially the shooting war begins in April of seventy five. Right. So by the time we're talking about the summer of seventy six, there's been you know warfare, a sort of a, a weird tense state of war without a whole lot of action mm -hmm. for almost a year. 
because the British are busy, like trying to build up, you know, build build a, build up a big enough army and get the armada together and 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 mount an invasion. Um, that's taking a while. So there's this kind of tense, you know, lull you might call it after the famous, you know, Lexington and Concord moment. Right. And in that in that year, near nearly, I mean, you know, more than a year, really, um, the debate among the Americans about in the Continental Congress. And within the states as well about what to do, what this was, what this war was about, and whether who was for it, who was against it, and what was the purpose of it was, you know, it, it, the the main line was that it was to f- force the British to come to their senses and kind of restore a previous sort of sense of sort of ben- benign neglect that had gone on before, say, 1763. The idea of breaking away as as breaking the basic, you know, compact between the colonies and the crown. Uh, was was considered by many many you know staunch patriots by many staunch American patriots was considered um you know out, outlandish and also just sort of infeasible and unworkable and how can we fight a war for independence I mean this is the greatest army in the world and they're not going to get they're not going to give us up as as colonies we might be able to harass them back into where we think the relationship ought to be but fighting a war of independence was was a, quite an out there idea definitely right so the so the the violence at lexington for example i mean it, it sounds very modern and a lot of, i know a lot of war buffs have this idea that in the old days they fought their wars to the death and it's only recently that that acts of war symbolic violence have come into vogue but that's really not true as we find over and over and it, it sounds like uh, the, the mainstream position was that we have made our symbolic violence we have made our gesture there's there's no way we're going to have a British army march all across our houses and and fields because that generally involved a lot of suffering, right? We've made our gesture. Nobody's talking about a massive war. Yeah, I think I think it was it was more divided than that, or more sort of you know in in some ways more incoherent than that. That, that right. that's kind of a that's kind of a rational position you've just laid out. I'm not <laughs> sure that as a, that as a group. I, I think as a group, no, it wasn't quite that clear. I mean, certainly uh, the United States, as it had was sort of forming itself as a, as a you know, the Continental Congress, the, the United, the, the states trying to sort of unite or were definitely preparing for invasion, preparing for war. So, but many were hoping to forestall that and actually expecting, not only hoping, but, but expecting to forestall that. So you have militias drilling for sure. Um, and it's, you know, there, there is a state of war and there, and there, there's stuff going on along the coast, um, sort of desultory warfare going on along the coast. And there's a sense that the British are probably going to invade. And then there's a series of things that occur, like when they find out, oh, the King's hired, you know, German mercenaries or whatever that really feed into war fever. Um, so, uh, there's. But 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 general responsible leadership for a long time, and those who thought of themselves as general responsible leadership, were hoping to forestall the war, hoping that reconciliation could be achieved by, you know, a series of letters or statements or documents, um, that you know that there was not necess- that even though all these things were happening, and of course you prepare for war defensively, even if you're not expecting to or hoping not to fight it, um, they were definitely many were hoping not to fight the kind of war that ended up ensuing. For sure, that's true. Right, right. Real quickly, that you, you, I remember you quoted here Samuel Adams when when it came to, when he was right uh, that it, that the Brits were bringing in the Hessian mercenaries. He called them um, myrmidons. Is right? Is that Samuel Adams called M M Y R M I D A N S? What is a merm? I never heard that word before. Myrmidon. That's a typical classical pedantic allusion to uh, Achilles' men who were uh, uh, compared to ants um, for their ability to swarm and pillage. But I wasn't aware it had such a pejorative connotation. I mean, Achilles' guys usually get a good rep in the Iliad. Uh, we should we should point out here, by the way, that uh, the War Nerd is coming out with a a War Nerd translation update of and uh, excellent because I've read read it and it's really good of the Iliad, which should be coming out when John? Yeah, uh, <laughs> now ish uh, or, or, or in a couple of months. In a couple um, of months, yeah. Oh, the War Nerd's version of the original War Nerd. Certainly in the West book, um, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Iliad, bloody book. I look forward to that. That is good news. <laughs> yeah. well, it's a great story, and it was put in the hands of classical pedants, and uh, it deserves better. 
Yeah, it's it's fun and gory, definitely. Yeah. Um, so getting back yeah. to this, so um, so you're, I mean, you're the action there, and even though you move back and, and, and forth in history, but really the action takes place. A bulk of it in May uh, through, uh, through sort of mid June, or but really May and June of 1776, and so let's start yeah. there. And then I also want to talk about these different m- major figures uh, behind the, the Declaration. There's some great characters. Again, you 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 humanize these people who are kind of statues, you know, in our in our historical understanding, and they become. Very flawed and kind of scary, some of them. But uh, uh, but but so let, let's start off with the beginning of May, and and it, the action takes place in in Pennsylvania and in Philadelphia. So I guess first of all, why is Philadelphia and Pennsylvania so important to whether or not the colonies are going to go for independence? What, what's so important about that area? Yeah, well, I mean, Pennsylvania was was really already the Keystone State, as it's still called. I mean, ge- ge- geographically alone, uh, it it was you know it's that middle colony situation where if the colonies were going to unite in any kind of military way, uh, the the fear would would be that a lot of the revolutionary energy was coming from the South, especially Virginia, and from New England, especially Massachusetts. So. They, they're not anywhere near each other, and, and, the, and the idea, the fear would be that you could divide easily. If, if the middle colonies didn't go along, you, the Brits could easily divide mm-hmm. the, two, the two most sort of uh, – the two most vociferously uh, uh, liberty-oriented uh, regions of, of, the, of the country. So there's that. Um, but also Philadelphia at this time was you know, probably the second most sophisticated city in the empire. It was mm-hmm. considered it – was, it, it was richer – uh, than than other places, um, it was just a very very uh, well established, politically established, financially established place. Mm-hmm. Uh, when you know you just sort of think about like the narrow streets of what's now the north end of Boston and so forth, it was sort of had a sort of a medieval feeling uh, in a way. It kind of grew up a little more chaotically. Philadelphia had a more elegant quality, and just, just there was just a lot of a power there and without because without Philadelphia without Pennsylvania you couldn't really do anything um and of course therefore it was hosting it's the host uh colony it's the, it's the host city for the continental congress right uh if you can't get Pennsylvania to go for independence you can't really do it i mean it just couldn't be done it's it's also yeah. at that time kind of the the seat of fi- of finance and merchant power is that right um more yeah, than there was yeah. a lot of i mean yeah i would say yes that was true about you know this all the seacoast cities i guess but i think the the i mean certainly robert morris who became the financier of the revolution and was the sort of the leading finance guy of his american finance guy of his day he was a philadelphia merchant and he represented a class of middle colony merchants who were beginning to sort of see the world uh in interstate financial terms. So a lot of that energy is focused in Philadelphia as well. Now, here's where, here's where I have to reveal my um, uh, ignorance. You know, as somebody who learned this in, in the very off-putting way it's taught in American public schools, or, or was in my day anyway, which is the, the thing you always learn about the early days of Pennsylvania is um, William Penn, uh, a Quaker, a good guy, a pacifist, uh, treated the Native Americans with respect and all that. So city as, grids, the grids, right? The the city's yeah, laid yeah. out like a grid, wasn't that pen? Yeah, yeah. right. The urban yeah. grid. Yeah. The urban grid. Yeah. So has has it lost its Quaker character by this time? The Quaker character of of uh, Pennsylvania had changed markedly since since Penn's time. Uh, the Pens who were still. Um, you know, the proprietor, and that's here. Well, here's another thing. It's a proprietary colony, right? So that's, that's the, that goes back to the William Penn period, you know, on charters, on charters from the king, but not, uh, but, but the governor is not a royal governor. The governor is the proprietary governor. And the Pens themselves, who were still the uh, proprietors, were no longer Quakers. They were oh. Anglicans living in living in London at this time, <laughs> um, and so wow. and it, they absentee used, they landlords, used family members sometimes as governors, uh, as as their governors, they're, they're on the ground, um, and they were using a family member at this time, uh, but they had used others as well who were not family members. So the the Penn's relationship to the to the whole scene was was had changed markedly in itself. 
Um, so, so that that relationship to Quakerism had changed. There was still a Quaker uh, power in the uh, in the legislature in the assembly, but it's this is a thing that a lot of history seems to me to get wrong. Um, I think it partly is due to John Adams's insistence that the reason Pennsylvania, this is his his, his idea, the reason Pennsylvania uh, was so reticent about joining uh, in this idea of of, revol- of revolution for independence was that there was this pacifist Quaker element dominating the assembly. Um, and actually, I do some history in, declara- in the book declaration about um, just how that had, too had changed. And actually, the Quaker power, the strict Quaker power was by no means nearly so powerful as it had been. Um, Benjamin Franklin uh, and others had already sort of taken care of some of that years before. And uh, Adams was just, you know, completely wrong, or maybe he was deliberately, um, deliberately prevaricating. I don't know to try to cast Pennsylvania's reluctance to 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 go for independence in pacifist terms. That was definitely not what was happening. It was not a it was not a Quakerism issue that kept, that kept right. Pennsylvania reluctant for so long. But if he was a, if he was a great propagandist, and it sounds like he was, then that would be the sensible thing. Like, of course, any sane person would be in favor of the revolution. They they can't because they have this deep religious objection. Otherwise, they'd be for it like anybody else. Yeah, right. And he he and he, he wasn't even that nice about it. It was like they can't because they're a bunch of you know weakling, passive <laughs> pacifist Quakers, you know. And he he really accused John Dickinson, who was the majority leader in the Pennsylvania Assembly and at the beginning of the story, really probably the most powerful politician in America, who then becomes probably for a while the least powerful politician in America um, through this independence issue. He Adams accused him, accused Dickinson. Uh, he blamed Dickinson's reluctance to go for independence on just being, you know, whipped around by his wife and his mother, who was <laughs> supposedly, according to Adams, strict Quakers, which is One just absolutely Quaker fantastical. Cuck. I mean, <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. I mean, it's just, you know, and it was, it was, it was strong propaganda. It was very strong propaganda, and I, and Adams may even have believed it. It's just hard to know. Always. Well, one thing I'll, uh, one thing I'll say about John Adams, he's he's got the art of invective down pretty well. I, I don't know about compared sure to, does, but yeah. he, he's pretty good. Like some of the stuff he says about Thomas Paine, we'll get to that. It's, Oh yeah. Uh, I love that. Stuff. It's I mean, really that's why funny. he's so great. I mean, yeah. it's a problem for history because he's so, he wrote so much and he wrote so vividly that we tend to think, Oh, well, I mean, he's, he's our major source for a lot of what happened. Right. But of course, a lot of the time he's just completely lying, <laughs> you know, <laughs> So it's, it's not – you have to really uh, take a lot of what he says with a grain of salt. But he's very – he can be very funny. And his, yes. his rage makes him quite funny. Yes, yes. And also another thing in, uh, that you, you touch on, which I really like, is the kind of the physical conditional of a lot of these – you know, important actors in this John Adams, Samuel Adams is Samuel Adams is kind of this, this, uh, you know, older than his age is in his fifties, but he seems like somebody much older and, and not very healthy at all, but he's this ball of, of will of scary willpower uh, inside. And Dickinson is also weak, which plays a big role in all this. He seems to have some health issues as yeah, well. It's partly that, the, you know, in, it's the times in part, I mean, these people were just, not well a mm-hmm. lot of the time. It was part of the, you know, Samuel Adams had a tremor uh, that was sort of on and off, but sometimes really bad. John Adams uh, had, you know, just, just a list of diseases that John Adams <laughs> suffered from, just the thing, you know, sometimes mysterious. Mm-hmm. Dickinson had all kinds of physical problems. I mean, you're, you're talking about, you know, this is not a macho, uh, athletic group of people. This no. is like... Um, this is a different time and a different, and yet they were having these incredibly impassioned battles with one another um, that are that are uh, you know decisive in world history. Yeah, makes me feel like a whiner, kind of. You know, that, <laughs> but um, all right, so let's get well, back. We did to- some whining too, you know. I mean, John Adams <laughs> whined like crazy in his letters about his physical, you know. You know so yeah, it's not just us. I know it's it's kind of what makes it, there's a lot of things I don't like Adams and his politics but he's he's really sympathetic as a character for in a lot of ways because yeah. he's he's whiny he's ambitious and uh you know and a good writer um but all right so uh so let's get back to this so it's the beginning of May 1776 we have to have Pennsylvania in order f- for there to be a you know a successful rebellion against the British, without Pennsylvania, as you pointed out in your book, a whole host of other 
middle colony states would I mean they'll go where Pennsylvania goes New York New Jersey Delaware Maryland right um and so they hold a vote um because it's it's so the the assembly the Pennsylvania assembly is still controlled by this guy John Dickinson who is actually he, he's he's not a weakling the way Adams put it he is pro war but he's pro reconciliation war in order to get a better deal from the Brits and so they 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 hold a new vote and Samuel Adams John Adams and some radicals are kind of um, trying to r- remake the Pennsylvania Assembly so that it's more pro-independence. The vote takes place in the beginning of May, and the the reconciliation is surprisingly win. Um, so I guess set that up, and then what, you know, how does that happen, and what are they going to do about it? That May 1st, 1776 election in, in in Pennsylvania for the for the Assembly is, you know, overlooked as a strange and decisive sort of moment in the history of getting to a declaration of independence because it where the independent crowd thought they were going to be able to prevail at the voting booth and get a slate of pro independence legislators into the Pennsylvania assembly and thus, you know, put Dickinson in the minority. Um, and with everything that they did to control that election, uh, you know, legitimate and illegitimate, they failed. Uh, and, and it's it's really it's the closest thing to a referendum on the question of independence mm. that was ever held prior to uh, actually going for independence. And it happened May 1st, 1776. And it was, uh, you know, there's a lot of controversy about how close it was or wasn't it what you know, among scholars, I mean, about how it how it actually went down. Mm. But but the reconciliation uh, position won and they didn't get a slate of, of new legislators for for independence into that into that all important legislature. So this was a huge setback for the idea of declaring independence for the Adamses, John and Samuel Adams, and also for their, their pro independence kind of cohort in Pennsylvania. So then they had to kind of double down. I mean, they thought they were going to do it by, by electoral means, by sort of legitimate means, you could say. Um, And now they're like, well, what are we going to do? They're not going to give, I mean, the thing about the Adamses and (laughs) all of these people, they just didn't give up. I mean, you know, so that that sets up the sort of the next act in the drama, which is where they're like, okay, we can't do it through the voting booth. We can't do it legitimately. Let's do it illegitimately, <laughs> or let's do it extra legally, or however you want to put that. Right, and this is where we get to this very lost episode of American history, which is it's essentially like a a, a left populist or working class coup that that uh, that you know takes or, or uprising, but done in in cahoots with these elitist Whigs like the Adamses, um, because they both have a, they both think that they're going to win out in the end from, um, from a, a revolution or independence from the Brits. Right. So, so how do yeah. they, uh, so, uh, you know, so much of this history actually it turns out has to do with these kind of sneaky legalisms, you know, a, um, a resolution and then a sneaky preamble to a resolution rather than these things that I've always loved about the revolution, which are the blue lines going this way with an arrow mm-hmm. and the red lines going that way and the little, <laughs> you know, but so yeah. much has to do with these little res, uh, resolutions and preambles. It's not the most dramatic stuff, but I don't know. Can you sum it up? <laughs> what, what they, what they do there? <laughs> yeah. It's more like political drama than, than warfare yes. drama. Yes. I mean, there really isn't a lot of war, actual warfare going on at this moment. Um, but yeah, so having lost the, uh, having lost what, you know, kind of amounts to the the biggest, the only thing like a referendum, like, well, the people aren't really going for independence, you could say, or at least the people who were qualified to vote, right. which tended still to mean, even though they'd opened the franchise even further for this election in order th- thinking that they could get sort of a populist push for independence, it still didn't work and they hadn't opened it all the way. So now we get this thing you just raised, which is this strange sort of, um, uh, you know, alliance, the classic sort of devil's bargain on both sides where politics make the strangest bedfellows where you get um elite republican types like john adams making common cause with true like small d democrat types who existed back then um and that's one of the things that's been forgotten is people like thomas Paine, he's the most famous but the other philadelphia sort of populist uh, democratic agitators um, people who are not known to history, like Thomas, or not what they're not—they're not known to the public history, right. I should say, like Thomas Young and Christopher Marshall and James Cannon, 
um, who are organizing the working class. And the reason they're organizing the working class for independence is because they believe that if you that in the in the revolution against England, there might there could also be a, re, a social and a political and economic revolution in America. So they're trying to kind of combine the, the revolutionary imperial moment with a real revolution in Pennsylvania to throw out the uh, the elite structures by getting the vote, by getting uh, uh, everybody, uh, every male, every white free male, the right to vote. Um, which would be, which was a revolutionary act, as limited mm-hmm. as that sounds today, um, was would be a revolutionary act because the whole idea, from the John Adams point of view, of what you know, what how liberty works and how rights work, were really tied up with property. But the idea, the radical, the radical, the true radicals in Pennsylvania, their idea was to uh, was to dissociate r- rights, political rights, from property ownership and open the franchise. Um, to those without without pro- sufficient property, not only to vote but also to to hold office, that was a revolution. And really, in the the grand sweep of the story, I mean, there really was a revolution in Pennsylvania, um, not just a departure from the from the crown from the empire, but uh, there was an actual economic and political revolution in Pennsylvania in which they achieved this end right. and overturned. You know, illegally, extra legally, not through any legitimate uh, voting process, they overturned Dickinson's government and put in a new radical government in which um, uh, unpropertied people were now allowed to vote and hold office. They did that by making common cause with these better known uh, elites who had no interest in such revolutions. They just wanted to separate from England. That was radical enough right. for them. I mean, that was that was already pretty extreme. So that kind of that dynamic, the dynamic of the sort of the the sort of elites who want to maintain elite power but want to get away from England, and the populists who want to give the people the power um, in the context of getting away from England. That dynamic put some people together who really hated each other but managed to work together to get uh, Pennsylvania overthrown um, and swing its great weight over to the cause of independence. There's one question I want to ask here. Uh, the uh, I'm still trying to imagine the, the military plan here. And uh, as you said, um, the reconciliation party was thinking about a major war because I, I asked if they were just thinking about a little symbolic violence and no, they weren't. They were thinking about a real war with the empire. What, how did they imagine that war and why did they imagine that it would end with the empire making a deal with them rather than just rolling over them? Right. Well, you're asking kind of the question that the more independence oriented people were also asking, like, how would this actually work? I mean, for us, you know, we need to fight a war. We need um, foreign allies. We can't, you know, this is the John Adams and Samuel Adams point of view. And it makes actually this part of it makes a lot of sense. You know, the idea that we're going to battle the British by threatening warfare and actually even fighting battles. We're going to sort of push them to an agreement to go back to restoring our rights. I mean, one of the arguments, the powerful arguments that Samuel and John Adams made, I think, on this was was sort of like, well, that's actually not very realistic. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you know, to, to actually if they decide to fight us, we're going to need the French and the Dutch and other foreign allies. And there's no chance in hell of getting any sort of foreign alliance for a war unless we have declared ourselves independent. I mean, right. we have to actually and that's to get to like the Declaration of Independence itself, which we're talking about, you know, in the, the weekend here. Um, that's the real purpose of the Declaration of Independence was to make it plain to the rest of the world that there was a rationale, basically, a, a legitimate rationale for this move. And the purpose of that was, I mean, the, really the most you know, practical purpose of that was to get these foreign alliances, military alliances, and of course, financial alliances as well in order to fight that war at all. So it's really not clear, you know, I mean, I think the people like John Dickinson had a kind of moral consistency about what they were doing, but whether they had a, a very thought out you know, very thought out military strategy, I think, uh, is doubtful. Okay. Yeah, that's good to know. Cause you never hear about that. You always get this idea, you know, like there were the Tories and there were the revolutionaries and then maybe there were some fence sitters, but this, this reconciliation position is quite a new thing. Yes. Yeah. The, yeah, the Tory thing, you know, I mean, John Adams would call the reconciliationists Tories because that was a way of, again, you know, defaming them. 
um, and, and questioning their patriotism, you know, to the to the colonies and to their own colony. But really, the the the, the, the important struggle in leading up to the Declaration wasn't between, you know, loyalists and diehard sort of pro pro British. Um, pro King people that 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 ship had sailed. Um, it was really between these rec- it was between two kinds of patriot really because the reconciliationists right. were patriots too, and that that piece of that story does tend to get lost. Yeah, right. So um, before we get back to the action, I want to get I want to just talk about a couple of these people here uh, that who's, that who, that you kind of draw out um, the, the, some of the main actors starting with. Starting with Samuel Adams and John Adams. Um, so talk about, I mean, if I were to kind of pull out quotes or something that would best describe them, but I'd like you to get more into them. Samuel Adams is more, uh, he comes from a more elite Boston family than his second cousin, John Adams, who's a bit younger than he is. Um, but the quote I would sort of use with Samuel Adams, well, first you, you say he wants a Christian Sparta, that's his kind of his Calvinist ideal goal, but um, it's sort of burn after reading is another thing about him, right? Um, he does not care at all about fame. In fact, he's he he doesn't want any fame. He doesn't want anybody to remember anything he does. That that I I find his his willpower and his discipline like that you know really impressive and a bit scary. We have no idea actually. You know, we know Sam Adams is somebody important. Um, and we know that because he's on a beer label, but I, I'm not yeah, sure exactly. we really know what he was about. Um, and uh, he's, you know, he's he's quite effective and scary. And then John Adams is kind of on the other end. He's, I mean, very bright, but he's more a provincial lawyer with a lot of ambition, uh, a lot of kind of provincial wounded ambition and uh i like this quote that you i don't know if, if he said this but you pulled out this quote from tacitus which kind of defined him which is because uh, uh, he's constantly trying to rationalize his own desire for fame and so this tacitus quote contempt of fame is contempt of virtue he's trying to kind of rationalize his his just burning desire to be famous and to be somebody um so anyway if you could just talk a bit about those two and then the, the story of the boston massacre well, yeah, Samuel Adams, um, you know, the, he, there's, there's two ways of looking at him. A, to not know who he is at all, except for the beer guy, <laughs> um, which is, you know, just not really who he was at all, like sort of an honest brewer sort of type of guy. He was, or, or the other way to look at that people look at him is, um, equally unrealistic, I guess, that, you know, behind every, behind every move that was made in the 1760s is the secret hand of John Adams, as if he almost had magical powers. John or Sam? Um, I'm sorry. Samuel. Yes. Sam. I mean, yeah, okay. Yes. Yes. Yeah. And even even calling Samuel Adams Sam is a little is sort of a right. I think a later construction. I mean, we tend to do it. Uh, you know, it sounds nice, but actually, I don't think he was called Sam. Yeah. Much he, would have, he would have drawn um, himself up to his full height. And would have, <laughs> yeah, maybe. It's too populist, yeah, I think. Well, yeah. well, not very impressive. Right? <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah. That's so. So there's that. I mean, we want him to be this kind of man of the people. He was actually the, you know, uh, John Adams was the country cousin. You know, Samuel Adams brought John Adams along. He, Samuel Adams cultivated younger, bright men uh, to sort of bring them along into this kind of more radical uh resistance to to the british imperium and he was uh, astonishingly you know he was quiet Mm -hmm. and abstemious and he dressed shabbily very shabbily Mm -hmm. even though he actually came from the more elite branch of the family um he was just one of these amazing revolutionary leaders and he was very interested in cultivating the body of the people in opposition to british power um in massachusetts but that didn't make him like, you know, a small D Democrat, his vision, you know, that Christian Sparta thing you said, he had a, a vision, you know, he, he associated the popular will very much with his own will mm-hmm. um, and how things ought to be. He really was kind of a trying to throw things back to a kind of lost Puritan tradition or it was getting lost, had been getting lost. Uh, that that's that's kind of where his positions lay. Where it's sort of, let's get back to the good, lean, mean, virtuous, you know, Massachusetts, New England. Um, uh, oh, that's another question I wanted to ask you. Um, it's one that unfortunately comes up all the time, usually pretty superficially in American politics. Which is, were these people devout? Were some of them devout? When when he uh, advocated return to Puritanism, it sounds like you're talking about Puritanism in in more like cultural than 
doctrinal terms, what, were they like uh, devout believers? Yeah, well, I think Samuel Adams was devout, certainly in his practice. I think he was. Yeah, it's hard to get inside their heads and know, you know, how fervently a Samuel Adams engaged with, you know, the experience of religion. I, I, I don't think I know the, the answer to that, but definitely, um, you know, they, and they were, they were very set in their ways in religious, in religious terms. I mean, when they, you know, uh, to hear for a, for a Calvinist type like, uh, Samuel Adams to sort of be subjected to an Anglican church ceremony, for example, was, was a notable moment for him. Like they were trying, you know, they were trying to make common cause across what seemed to us now to be rather mar- mild, dif- you know, differences. But of course, as you guys know, you know, huge hundreds of years of war uh, uh-huh, had yeah. ensued from Catholic versus, versus Protestant um, feeling. And, and this went on. I mean, we're still talking about the 18th century. This was still going on. I mean, so uh, um, it, it was devout- going on when I was, yeah, it was going when I was born, I, my family named yeah. me John Carroll after the you know the first Catholic bishop in America, and I was raised to hate John Jay. I didn't quite know <laughs> I had to hate John Jay, but I had to hate John Jay. <laughs> well, there you go. Yeah. So, uh, dev- you know, I, devout probably in some ways, maybe, but like certainly committed to the to the, to certain you know religious precepts. Yes. Samuel Adams was. I see John Adams as more like uh, he believed that religious religion was good because it kept people, you know, focused on something a better. Uh, it kept people disciplined and in line and sort of you know not always giving in to their immediate feelings. And it's just a you know culturally and um, you know civically a good thing to have religion. But I don't know. I, I think he was quite skeptical actually of anything regarding like the literal truth of scripture and so forth. I don't think he would have bought into that. But he liked religion because it was you know institutional and generally in his mind positive. Uh, and and jo- so John Adams was more like, uh, one of the ways I think about him is he's more like the, not a Puritan New Englander, a Yan- the development of the Yankee type, the right. super mm. busy, super bustling, super, you know, uh, creative, always trying to better himself. That desire for fame, I mean, fame meant virtue in some ways to these guys. I mean, you, mm. it wasn't just, I want to be famous like, you know, Kim Kardashian. It was like, <laughs> I want to be famous for like, Good, being good, doing good in the world, having had a really important impact on a, right. on my time for the betterment of humanity and so forth. And that's that's John Adams. I mean, his personal ambition was intense, but he wanted to yoke it to the to the to the good, you know. Right. And of course, he always felt that he was doing that, which was convenient for him. So that he, <laughs> you know, he didn't he didn't he didn't uh, self criticize. He criticized himself for being too ambitious sometimes, but he always right. thought, you know, that that he was serving the good. He always certainly felt that that. Um, so, it, the different, and he was basically at this point, you know, he's the more famous Adams now, mm-hmm. John. But um, uh, at that point, we're talking about in 1776, in the spring and summer of 1776, he was basically Samuel Adams, like apparatchik, <laughs> like his top best, smartest operator, mm-hmm. lawyer. John Adams talked much more in the in the Congress than Samuel Adams did, uh, but he was definitely carrying out Samuel Adams's program. Mm-hmm. So um, to give, a, a again, the example of the Boston Massacre and really the John Adams' decision, or as we think of it, this is, again, one of these great mythical moments, especially kind of with, with the civil liberties crowd. I think that, you know, um, uh, John Adams defending the British captain and militiamen who, who killed the American protesters in Boston. Um, it was actually... A conspiracy. I don't know what else to call it. It was. Uh, can, can you can you tell that story real quickly, c- c- so that it, people understand how yeah, these guys operated? You know, in 1776 as well. Yeah, it's it's kind of come down to us as well. You know, a profile in courage. John Adams right. defending the the British soldiers in the Boston massacre because the idea is it went up against everything that was going on locally. He had to like go out on his own and in the in the de- in the defense of you know of of fair trials and higher principles um, and equality before the law. He 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 bucked the immediate system, which was sort of the, the Sons of Liberty system, Samuel Adams' system, and the people who were running the sort of the streets at that time, John Adams, you know, took a chance, took his life in his hands, showed courage. Was barely ended. paid, right? It was, wasn't even yes, paid. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> Um, but in real life, um, th- there's actually no way that John Adams wouldn't have, would have, would have done that without 
the uh, pretty explicit approval of the Sons of Liberty. And there are a couple of scholars who have written about this. This is not just my own eccentric, uh, you know, uh, revisionist theory. I mean, this is now considered to be, uh, again, again, not not in the public discussion, but in scholarly terms. I mean, this is I don't think this is a controversial thing to say at this point to sort of debunk that profile and courage and note that John Adams would never have actually done that if he hadn't had the approval of the Sons of Liberty. He was very much working in Samuel Adams' orbit all the time. And Samuel, but it, but it's a little more complicated even than that because like. Samuel Adams wanted those soldiers to have a good defense. That was actually a better, would serve the propaganda situation better for him if they had a good defense, if there was no way somebody could have said, um, you know, they were weakly defended or anything like that. And he had his own second cousin actually as the lawyer. So that looks pretty good. But I don't think Samuel Adams expected them to get off, any of them to get off. I think when John Adams took that job, he took it largely at the behest and with the approval of the Sons of Liberty. But once he took it, he did. He just did the lawyer thing, you know. He actually <laughs> just went for it, and he successfully he he prevailed in, in some cases. And I don't think that was part of an original. I don't think that was part of the right. plan. I think it's sort of a one of those weird things where it's like, I'll, okay, I'll do it, you know. Mm-hmm. But you know, I'm going to actually I now. He's competitive. He really to be, you know, yeah, yeah, competitive. He wanted to be known. He wanted to be known as a great lawyer. Yeah. You know, the whole world is watching sort of feeling. The right. whole empire is watching or whatever. So that's a funny uh, that's a funny dynamic. But he was well, rewarded that, that, at the end for having. No, go ahead. I'm sorry. Yeah, just to finish the story of John Adams and one reason we, we know there are a couple of smoking guns. But one reason we know that he, he was not really bucking the Sons of Liberty is he was rewarded with political, you know, political appointment right. uh, after that by the very people who were controlling uh, those kind of appointment, the, the, the radicals who were controlling that kind of appointment at the time. Right. That same year, he was uh, named to the boss to the assembly, right, for, uh, as a representative yeah, of Boston. Exactly. So it was, it was basically yeah, actually not appointment. I shouldn't say appointment. Political support. Yeah. R- right, because they they were they essentially arranged the caucuses that that nominated the candidate. Right, right, right. So yeah. So when you're when you say Sons of Liberty, I mean I, we have a lot of non-American subscribers, right. so a little some of this may be unfamiliar, but it, it sounds like a very familiar insurgent operation where you have a street level violent urban militia group. And you also have a high-minded front group. Was there some division like that going on? Um, well, I would say more like the the, the Sons of Liberty, the, the motivate the, the motivating the street. You know, getting the street to come out and tear down buildings and tar and feather um, um, officials and so forth. Um, it's actually a, there's a complicated, you know, there's a good book on this that, and I, I, in my book, I don't really get into the details of this, but there's a couple of good books on this if people want to know about it, because those dynamics were very complicated between, you know, how far do you, how far does this sort of the, the, the elite group, the sons of Liberty, as you just said, sort of the elite, I wouldn't necessarily call front necessarily. It's, it's, it's how, how far are they going to be comfortable letting the mob quote unquote mm-hmm. go uh, in these actions, because what if you know, they, they definitely want um, violence on the street and they want a very particular kind of violence. It's sort of like the body of the people will not tolerate this kind of thing. And now, mm-hmm. you know, now the governor's house is going to get attacked and we're going to, and, and they're unleashing a very a basic form of, of, mob violence, which has to do with just, you know, turning everything upside down. You, you invade the homes of the rich, you take their stuff. Sometimes you'll just actually take their houses down brick by brick. That kind of, that kind of thing um, was definitely a tool that the Sons of Liberty were using to harass royal elements in Massachusetts government. Um, but but and I should say the other the other brilliant thing the Sons of Liberty did was not it was it wasn't just Massachusetts government they created these interprovincial uh, committees that were actually bringing uh, the the states together around this around this whole idea of resistance so this was their this was their their brilliance was was actually moving creating a kind of united a united front from uh, and taking over sort of trying to turn the legislate parts of the legislatures of the various colonies against the royal elements in those legislatures and the royal governors. So they were doing all that. Um, but then their, their quandary was always, well, it, some of this energy is just against elites. You know, some mm-hmm. of this populist um, uprising is just against elites. So how much do we want to encourage it? How much do we want to stifle it? And the 1760s are actually kind of a, certainly in Massachusetts, are sort of a story of, 
of, of on again, off again. Like, you know, how, how far do we let them go? Now we've got to like, you know, hold them back. Uh, that, that stuff is pretty complicated and, and I don't have a, a great handle on, on a, the day to day of how that all went, but the dynamic among elite revolutionaries. And again, it, we see it play out in Pennsylvania leading up the de- to the declaration. How far do the, are the elite revolutionaries willing to go in unleashing populist energy that could of course always turn against the revolutionary elites as well. Mm-hmm. Um, as it did in a, the Whiskey mm, Rebellion, right? As, as, as you yeah. described in, in your other books, I mean, the, in Shay's Rebellion, the Whiskey Rebellion, that once you uh, unleash that populist rage, it's not always easy to control. You want to use it as a, a sort of controlled provocation, but that's, it has its own ideas. Mm-hmm. Right, and once you start ta- that, right, and once you start talking about things like equality, right. um, you know, people are, might, ordinary people might expect to have equal access to the political process. <laughs> and, um, you know, they might get some expectations that mm-hmm. you don't really want to fulfill if you're a member of the elite. Even if you're a revolutionary against England, you're not looking to revolutionize American society. John Adams was really not looking to revolutionize society in Massachusetts. He was looking to revolutionize society in Pennsylvania in order to achieve his, his political ends there. Mm-hmm. Um, because, you know, he didn't care what happened to Pennsylvania. He thought, right. you know, <laughs> so, these people, all, so, these he, people he, all really despised each other. You know, that's the other <laughs> thing. They didn't, they didn't, like people from Massachusetts thought people from Pennsylvania were jackasses just based <laughs> on being Pennsylvanian. So if they want to overturn their society and let a lot of unpropertied people vote, you know, you know, ew, gross. You know, <laughs> just another stupid thing done in Pennsylvania. Yeah. But he could use that for his own political purposes and make damn sure the same thing didn't happen in Massachusetts. Right, which they did, as you point out. I, was it in the Shays Rebellion, um, which was a very uh, kind of a populist rebellion against creditors? Um, Samuel Adams wanted to hang them all, right? Yeah. Now, now that uh, you know Samuel Adams at that point, I think he was lieutenant governor, maybe right. of, of Massachusetts. But this is post the revolution. Um, the same kind of thing happens. The same kind of populist uprising occurs in Massachusetts um, against established elites. And now Samuel Adams is a member of, you know, the established elite. He always had been in Massachusetts, but now there's no royal government anymore. Um, it's an independent. Uh, it's an independent. Uh, uh, state, and he was for the death penalty for the Shazite rebels because he said he, he believed you know there's no rationale for this now, you know <laughs> you have your liberty we're now independent of right. Great Britain so there's there's no legitimate reason to do any of the stuff that we used to do also <laughs> recently against Great Britain you know? right I, I'd like to focus a little bit on on uh, the Boston massacre because uh, for our non-American listeners this is something that we all grow up. Yes. learning about, uh, and we learn a very simplified version of it, which is not necessarily wrong in itself. You're not trying to turn fifth graders into uh, historians of the 18th century. But uh, when, when you look into it in detail, as you have, the story changes markedly. And, and uh, it, it seems to have been clearly a, pro, a, a premeditated provocation to force British soldiers on the streets to open fire on a crowd and a really extreme provocation. And and then there was a, an attempt afterwards to, to get these soldiers convicted. And and this is, brings me to the real shock for me of, of the American Revolution, uh, the extraordinary mildness of, of the British colonial regime towards these colonists as opposed to their treatment of other people they had colonized. Well, that's really interesting because I don't know that much about how the British government treated uh, some of their other people they had colonized. I mean, in this in this context, um, I would say it's true that the I mean, these these things that happened that are supposed to be these terrible signs of, of oppression. Um, and of course, you know, the city was militarily occupied and that's definitely going to, you know, get people, get people's attention. And it did. I mean, this is one of the reasons Boston was so, not just Boston, but all of Massachusetts was, I think, sort of so readily unified against the British. Um, but you know, for Samuel Adams, for Samuel Adams, this is like a good thing because, he, you know, the Stamp Act, uh, which is an, er- an earlier thing, he saw that as a, you know, a, a good thing. It brought people together against the British. Anything they do that is blatant, it's like when he, you know, or hiring Hessian mercenaries or whatever, anything they do that's blatant is good because it brings, it, it, you know, gets people awakened to what they need to do to push them out. So, uh, he, it was Matt, it was Samuel Adams who named that event, uh, the Boston massacre. 
I mean, we, we just take, we just say it, we just use that term right. kind of without thinking about it, like as if there had been a massacre and then he turned it into, you know, I mean, once, once it had happened and there was the, the attempt to convict the British soldiers and all of that drama, um, you know, there were memorials that went on every year, every year they would have this big public memorial to the victims of the Boston massacre with, this was orchestrated by Samuel Adams as well. And everyone would give speeches and it was just all, all for the purpose of galvanizing, uh, people against against the British element in government. Um, and so, you know, and, and then Paul Revere made this, I mean, when we think of the Boston Massacre for a visual uh, a, a visual cue, we, we're always imagining, we've seen pictures or reproductions of Paul Revere's engraving of it, which is totally propagandistic as well. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and it's a totally inaccurate portrayal of what was going on. Uh, and that's, that's really interesting. I mean, this was all pretty concerted effort to to cast things to cast the the king at this point um you know even though they were still always so torn about whether they were arguing against parliament or arguing against the king i mean this was the army so it's kind of the king's army Mm. at the same time they don't want to they still don't want to attack the king directly but the idea of the king the development of the idea of the king as tyrant which kind of explodes in may of 1776 when he hires the hessians and so forth like he's thrown us out of his protection he's turned on us as this he's this grotesque monster of a tyrant this was a brilliantly constructed yes. you know fiction that samuel adams was largely and, and others were, were authoring at the time right well the the, the contrast that, that keeps striking me because i i studied this for literary reasons was the highland clearances um after the jacobite rebellion of 1745 i don't want to compare the treatment of american rebels to anything the empire did later because i think in general, the, the empire grows very ruthlessly and efficiently cruel in the 19th century, and it was much more uneven in the 18th century. But um, mm-hmm. in 1746, after the Highland rebels, who really come close to taking London, uh, were finally crushed. Uh, all the wounded on the battlefield of Culloden were bayoneted or shot. Uh, whole clan surnames were declared to have, quote, corruption of blood, end quote. Anyone bearing those surnames was either executed or ordered out of Scotland. Their land, their titles were confiscated. Uh, A whole culture was basically wiped out. I mean, one of the obvious reasons that would have been treated more severely is, you know, this did threaten London uh, in a way that nothing Mm -hmm. that happened in in North America would do. But... uh, I think it's interesting in some ways because people, when you when you point out that the American colonists got fairly uh, light treatment from from the British military, they say you know well they they were white and it's not that simple. The people in Scotland were technically white also, but they they were a direct threat to the capital. They were papists, or a lot of them were papists, which was anathema. Uh, that a lot of them spoke a different language and came from a different culture. Um, and they got ruthless treatment, ruthless treatment. The American colonists, uh, as far as I know, did not get that treatment because, you know, if you remember that bizarre Mel Gibson movie, <laughs> The, pa- the yeah. Patriot. Yeah, uh, yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> they have to uh, invent an atrocity. As far as I know... No village was ever penned up in a church during the American Revolution and burned to death. I mean, we hear stories about bloody Tarleton, but he never did anything like that. Yeah, it's really interesting. I yeah, uh, I can't swear, you know, that uh, I, I would say, you know, during in the actual war, of course, there were many, many. I mean, the war was extremely violent because it was a war and uh, there were many moments, um, you know. But again, you know, even I, I just jumped to like all the way into the war. Like, okay, so Anthony Wayne, who I write about in Autumn of the Black Snake, had a had a, uh, a, a revolutionary war career before the time I'm writing about there. And I'm, I, I talk a little bit about what's called the Paoli Massacre, um, which is a battle that Wayne lost in the revolution. Um, it, it wasn't a massacre. It was a battle, and Wayne lost it. Um, but it's it's routinely referred to, or it has been routinely referred to as the Paoli Massacre. And this this sort of, this the use... Can you uh, describe without, you know, it real quickly? Can you describe what um, happened real quickly? 
I could have described it better some like a year ago. I get that. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> if you uh, know how that works. Yes, yes, yes. I definitely uh, do. Definitely. Too well. But yeah. Generally speaking, I would say Wayne just did not succeed in uh, exerting, you know, good command in a, in a difficult situation, and um, had and there was a bay, it was a bayonet. It was it was a horrible. I'm not, I'm not saying it was a nice thing. It was a horrible uh, loss, and it was a bayonet. The bayonets of the British were, you know, feared for a reason. I mean, it was a it was a bayonet attack in which Wayne lost a lot of men. Um, but to, but it's just this sort of like calling it. A mass, the, the, the reflexive use of the term massacre and the Boston, to go back to the Boston massacre, I mean, you know, Samuel Adams named it that. Um, and here, one of the weirdest to me ramifications of that propaganda move is, uh, that we deal with in our own time right now is, um, the, one of the victims in the, Bo one of the, the dead in the Boston massacre, uh, was a guy named Crispus Attucks. And he's, he's well known now because uh, because he was African American, right? And he was he was one of the first victims. He was one of the victims in the Boston massacre, and so his story is taught um, for for obvious reasons. Because mm -hmm. the story has always been so you know so racially so white. The story's always been so white as mm -hmm. if as if there were no you know all the actors are white males, right? All, all the classic actors, um, and so it's always been a story that's that has left out you know. Uh, black people, poor people, women, all of the people who are not like John Adams or Samuel Adams have been left out of the story. So it's, it's always, it has been striking to, to historians in more recent years that one of the victims, one of the Patriot victims was this black guy. Um, so, so that story is taught, but it, it's so ironic to me that, um, that, that we use the, what we've never questioned is whether the Boston massacre was really a massacre or what the political and, and propaganda ramifications of that are. So many people, you know, put a pin in that Christmas attic story and go, look, here's this inspiring moment. I mean, sad, tragic, and yet inspiring because, you know, one of the first victims of that first great move toward American freedom and liberty was this African-American guy. But you have to believe, to, to, for that story to make sense and be as inspiring as people want it to be, and it is important to, to recognize the, the, the breadth of the, of the participation, of course, but for that story to be as inspiring as people want it to be, you have to really believe the Samuel Adams you know, version of the Boston Massacre in a way, and that version is, you know, was really concocted for propagandistic reasons. So this just is, a, to me, like one of the sort of classic uh, difficulties that we have in, in kind of confronting our own history. We're always looking for these inspiring moments mm -hmm. and, trying to, and trying to get more people included in them. But what if those moments themselves weren't so inspiring? Then the question becomes, you know, do you want to be included? in these moments or what do we mean when we're trying to include people in these moments yeah. and so forth yeah, yeah well to me it's just astonishing that british soldiers were convicted for firing on a mob which had surrounded and harassed them nobody was convicted for what happened in the highlands in 1746 it was I, uh, McPherson. I, I know this because I was studying uh james McPherson, who wrote the ossian poems this sort of quasi fake uh celtic epic uh, he was from a family that had been prescribed. They lost everything. That's why he had to resort to writing forgeries. Uh, and he's riding in a carriage, like in 1760, with James Boswell, and he says, I hate John Bull, you know, the, the protagonist of England symbolically, and then says, but I love his daughters, because meaning, you know, I find the women in London more attractive than the ones up in Scotland. But uh, <laughs> I mean, the, this resentment goes very, very deep. And when you start to find out why, it's because there were atrocities happening all over the place. Uh, but but in America, soldiers who fired on that mob were actually put on trial and convicted. It's a, if if you're thinking about imperial norm, it's it's astonishing. Yeah, that really is striking, and I don't think I've ever really thought that part through at all. It really, I mean, right, who would have even brought charges in the situations you're talking about in Scotland? I mean, this is th one thing, I, I mean, I don't know what the political situation was uh, in the same kind of detail in, in the Scottish situation you're talking about, but I mean, one of the oddball things that the Brits did when they colonized North America was they allowed these colonies in, to create um, legislatures and courts and stuff. Like they didn't do the, like the French were much more sort of like they're governing from home and there isn't a whole lot of 
you know, local government on the ground in North America. Um, but there was this tradition, longstanding tradition of forming legislatures mm-hmm. and, you know, and court systems, which of course had royal elements, um, obviously, or proprietary or royal elements in the upper houses. But like the lower houses were, it was considered, you know, important that the lower houses be elected, not from the mass of the people, but from the property owning elites, colonial elites. And now you get this crazy conflict where, I mean, I'm thinking out loud right now, like where British soldiers are being tried in a Massachusetts court. I mean, that's not how, you know, I would run an empire necessarily <laughs> if I were an emperor, uh, that my soldiers could be tried by my yeah. colonists in some court somewhere far away from home. I'd be like, what the hell are you talking about? You know, yeah. so that that is a very interesting feature of the whole tension that marks the that marks the lead up to the American Revolution. Right. I mean, yeah. it, in this sense, it, the colonies are kind of they're not exactly colonies and they're not exactly England 2.0. They're kind of trying to be both in a way, right? So it would make sense because if that were to happen, presumably uh, if s- soldiers fired on on people in you know Liverpool, there might be a trial over that. The soldiers might be put right. on trial. Yeah, that's right. And so right. it's sort of like uh, they they, they kind of not tried to Liverpool, have it. Though. Okay, not Liverpool. <laughs> yes, <laughs> I'm sorry. <Yeah. laughs> okay, but London, let's say, and yeah. um, and uh, and so the idea was well, they hadn't quite figured out yet. Are the American colonies actually kind of England 2.0, or are they colony colonies? You know, and and right because the British, what... the, the the American colonists were were insistent on their rights as Englishmen. Right. Really, I mean that's that's which is again you know the irony of the whole situation that the thing they felt had been violated. I mean, and Dickinson is a good example of this. I mean, Dickinson who didn't want independence but wanted no quarter on. The, the tax revenue, uh, the, the, the revenue bills, he thought they were unconstitutional and violated the rights of Americans as Englishmen. You know, mm-hmm. that's the thing. As Englishmen. He felt that was the perversion, that, that the English rights were being violated. Um, so that, that, that double nature of the Americans in the colonies that you're, that you're talking about, I, mean, I think that's really a salient point um, as we move toward, you know, the idea of independence. I mean, it's an irony that we ended up getting independence in the process of asserting rights as Englishmen. You know, I, I wonder if the the really, I mean, anomalously mild treatment of of incidents like the so-called Boston Massacre led to the reconciliationist position, like we can prosecute a war against Britain and they won't turn our towns into pillars of smoke on the horizon, which, you know, would be standard practice most other places. If it made them believe somehow that they could prosecute a, a limited war that would not devolve into mutual atrocity. I, I don't, I can't, I can't imagine, I, I don't know what all the reconciliations were thinking, but like, I don't think Dickinson, I don't think Dickinson, for example, feared a, war, a real full-on war. I think he he did say things like, you know, if they have to burn our houses to the ground and kill us all, we need to stand up for these principles. I mean, so yeah, I don't know. I don't know. I think he did yeah. actually. He was willing to to fight um, and and suffer actual invasion in, in defense of these of these principles, which seems kind of abstract to us. Like they're trying to raise a revenue for the treasury by taxing us. Like, I mean, this is this something you? You stand up and fight for, but I mean, you know, it goes back to the whole idea of what constitutional liberty is for those guys, which had to do again with takings and property issues and that you can't, you can't have the monarch, the sovereign cannot take your stuff without your consent. And the second, and and that consent is given through representative government. And the second he does so, he has become, you know, a criminal, a monster and a, a, and you know, a perversion of what monarchy ought to be. Oh, well, that that actually seems very familiar because I have the guilty habit of reading comment sections. And <laughs> I think they call themselves libertarians now, but there's millions of those people who think that this is worth dying for. Yeah. Or they say so anyway. But yeah. Yeah, that's true. I mean, I say it sounds abstract to us, but actually that's presumptuous. Yeah. <laughs> maybe maybe it doesn't sound abstract at all, because I just think I just think it's rare that people realize that just. These these tiny tiny I mean these comparatively small taxes, which which they really were I mean the US, uh, American colonists were the least taxed of anyone you know in the British Empire they were taxed much less than people in England, uh, 
too, um, that these that it wasn't about the amounts. You know, it was about the the the, I mean, for Dickinson, who really did have a consistent principle on this, not everybody did. Most people were were uh, inconsistent and just trying to get what they were trying to get. But Dickinson was quite consistent on this. And he I mean, it, it wasn't about how much it was. It was about what the structure of the rela- your relationship to government is. You know, mm-hmm. that was that that was the principle. So um, I want to talk now a bit about the uh, the the populist uh, working class radicals in Pennsylvania, which is which is the big kind of the the really big surprising um, element in the, in the story of the Declaration of Independence. Um, but first, Stephen set that up. You keep referring back in the book to this tension between the Levelers and Cromwell. I mean that that reappears again in the Declaration, and it seems to kind of reappear throughout time if you even go forward. But um, I don't know. First, can you talk about the the Levelers versus Cromwell and the Levelers? losing you know um and and because this gets into what you're talking about the the definition of of liberty what is liberty it's a word we throw around a lot but we don't really know even quite what it means anymore except what to be left alone but in cromwell and that adams and that tradition liberty is is sanctity of property um and i think for other people liberty is freedom from general any kind of oppression including the oppression of creditors um, to take your, you know, to creditors going after you and keeping you in debt. So, I don't know, can you talk a little bit about level, uh, Levelers versus Cromwell and then Thomas Young is a pretty interesting figure. Yeah, well, the Levelers really were probably among the first to say, this is going back to the Cromwell era and the, 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 the revolution in England and uh, the anti-monarchist revolution in England there where um, the Levelers who had were soldiers and this gets into where how war fits into things like this, into these issues. I mean, the, the level they were soldiers who were uh, of the working class. They were un- less propertyed or unpropertyed, and they did not have um, voting rights. And so they made an impassioned. You know, the Putney debates are are are, are what uh, are, are where these. The, if you you know people want to look this up, it's kind of it's pretty interesting and it's pretty interesting as background to to debates about liberty in in America. Um, in the Putney debates, there was a a passionate conversation about whether these unpropertyed soldiers who had served, uh, who had served to create sort of the, um, the Republic you could say, or the, the, the Republican idea of anti-monarchy in England for that time, whether they should be able to participate politically. And, um, the answer was no, they were not going to get to participate politically, but that, but that position uh, raises maybe for the first significant time the question of what does liberty actually mean and why why is it associated necessarily with property and if you've served the country why wouldn't you be able to you know sort of vote directly for your for your leadership um, that that's that's sort of a and and leveling leveling means it's and it's because it's a British word it's usually spelled with two L's or three L's I should say like leveling it would look like in English in American English. Um, Leveling became a term of of great opprobrium for the elites in America uh, in the 18th century. Like whenever they thought that the populist thing was getting out of control, they would say, "Oh, they're just they're they're leveling," and it, just, <laughs> it has to do with social social leveling. I mean, mm-hmm. trying to level society so that you know you you could say level the playing field. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and that was considered, I mean, by people like George Washington and Henry Knox and other elite and John Adams and other elites, like this leveling impulse uh, just means to them, it means sort of uh, oh, confiscatory, you know, we would, might even say socialist um, positions that they found absolutely contrary to liberty, um, as tyrannical as anything monarchical could be, uh, right. a, ty- a tyranny of the people. Uh, and so this does get into these crazy questions about like, well, what do we mean by liberty? Since our, our whole sense of rights still to this day kind of gets tr- the lineage of that is, is in these English ideas about property. And yet, of course, today we don't want, we don't think of rights and liberty as having exclusively to do with property or we don't think that we think it does. Mm-hmm. Um, that, yeah, it's a big, it's, it's, it's a big question. So then in Pennsylvania in 1776, you get, in a way, in the revolution within Pennsylvania, you get kind of the triumph of the levelers after all those years. These were the ancestors, in a way, politically and economically and spiritually of the leveling of the leveling impulse. And they actually succeeded in doing it in Pennsylvania. Um, 
even though they were doing it in conjunction with people like John Adams, who were totally anti-leveling, it happened in Pennsylvania. And they really did shut down the, uh, the assembly and say, we're not represented. I mean, the ordinary working class armed uh, militias said, uh, we're not represent. They said, we're not represented in this house. I think I'm getting that quote more or less right. This house no longer exists because we are not represented in it. And they set up a whole new government in which uh, ordinary working class people did have the vote and could run for office. Of course, I always have to you know, reiterate that it was limited to white, free males mm-hmm. uh, of majority age. So it's not a, 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 a total it's not a totally radical restructuring in that sense. But it was radical in the sense that it took the property issue away from the liberty issue. And that was, you know, no one no one on the elite side had ever, uh, you know, it conceived of 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 political participation separate from property ownership. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think going back to Athens, the idea of being a citizen and having property went hand in hand, even in ancient democracy, right? So it just, it hadn't even, the thought hadn't occurred to people that lowborns, as they would call, you know, that people without property would be, would have rights and be able to participate too. Um, So, but uh, Thomas Young now, so he's one of the kind of the, the Pennsylvania populist coup plotters. Um, and he plays a role in in the founding of Vermont, which I didn't know. And it kind of, it, when you when you go back and read your version of, of the Thomas Young story, Bernie Sanders starts to make a little bit more sense why he would come out of Vermont. Um, <laughs> I was kind of yeah, I didn't think of that. <laughs> uh, can you tell a little bit about uh, Thomas Young's history and um, uh, you know? Yeah, Young was a uh, he was a, a doctor, a medical doctor. And a, a definitely a social and economic radical of the 18th century. I mean, he uh, and and he uh, he just he sort of was self self made as a doctor. It was just a lot easier in those days to sort of you know apprentice yourself to a doctor, and then after a while, I guess you're a doctor, you know. And he was very good at uh, you know he read a lot. Um, he was very cultured, but he grew up you know sort of working class and, and upwardly mobile uh, in New York State, I believe at first, and then um, moved to. Boston, where he had scandalized the entire establishment medical community of Boston. And he was very, he was a loudmouth and very, you know, he would publish screeds against the local doctors. Now they didn't know anything. (laughs) And so actually a lot of the sort of Sons of Liberty elite types in Boston didn't like him, even though he was a, he was a revolutionary Mm. and they didn't like him because he was, you know, uh, calling them out on some of their ignorance of doctoring. And he was also, they also didn't like him because he was a true populist radical, Mm -hmm. but Samuel Adams saw, um, a very saw the saw the uses of Thomas Young in Massachusetts and and had sort of turned him on on creating helping create these ways of turning the turning the local legislatures against the king. So they Thomas Young learned a lot of organizing from Samuel Adams, even though he was actually interested in creating a much more democratic society than Samuel Adams was. Uh, he the Vermont connection is that he was sort of a patron and and mentor to Ethan Allen, who ended up. Um, you know, kind of taking over Vermont and Vermont, uh, Vermont was not, was never a, a colony. It was a territory argued over by New Hampshire and, uh, and New York states, but Ethan Allen and his brothers turned it into sort of their little fiefdom. Um, and actually Vermont, partly under the influence of, of Thomas Young, Vermont, um, declared its own independence from England in 1776 and, uh, created its own constitution and became the Republic of Vermont. And it, it uh, it didn't become a state until later. It was always this kind of weird, uh, experimental outlier, uh, partly under Young's influence. In the end, he goes to Philadelphia and reconnects with Samuel Adams there. He's become one of the Pennsylvania, out, sort of outsider Pennsylvania, Philadelphia uh, populist politicians trying to take over Pennsylvania and make it a and make it a pretty radically egalitarian place. I mean, when they, you know, Young is one of the people who. Um, you know, I, I used the word socialism earlier and said, mm-hmm. you know, it's sort of almost socialistic. I mean, it wasn't almost socialistic, really young. And one of his uh, partners in this, James Cannon, who mm-hmm. really organized the militias around this idea, when they were trying to develop the, the new constitution, the radical new constitution for Pennsylvania, they proposed uh, to, to put a constitutional cap on how much property any one person could own in Pennsylvania. Right. And this is in 1776. That didn't get through. That was too radical even for the other social radicals of Pennsylvania. But they, I, but what people don't seem to rem- know or remember, or it's not part of the public discussion, is just that, that, that that degree of social egalitarianism, like that you would use the power of the state to actually limit property ownership, 
um, in in the in in the in the pursuit of of, equi- of economic equality. Um, that that was that was going on in the 18th century, and that's what that was a lot of the impulse. Thomas Young was that was one of those guys. James Cannon was. They they um that's some of the that's some of the energy that actually led to the Declaration, even though the Declaration was not intended to do anything like that. Right. And just real quickly, also, as you point, uh, Thomas Young, so he, this, there was this sort of territory between New Hampshire and, um, uh, and New York, and it was called, it, it was called the Green Mountains, or is it still called the Green Mountains? I don't even know. And that's where, the, that's where Vermont, obviously, Vermont comes from the French for Green Mountains, right? And, yeah, I think, uh, didn't he, suge- did he suggest to Ethan Allen, he call it Vermont? Yeah, I think, I think in your book it says that, yeah. Like- a fancy French, a fancy French <laughs> name for the Green Mountains. <laughs> but but also it <laughs> which was are still, which are still here, right? But but also the idea was because uh, this is a recurring theme and problem um, in America, and this time it starts really becoming a problem is small farmers, uh, um, you know, being squeezed by creditors and landlords by being indebted and basically, you know, uh, losing their liberty, right? Not having freedom because because they can't renegotiate their debts to the creditors. And so they wanted to set up this kind of haven where they would no longer be encumbered by, um, by their debts. And, and, and that's been a constant theme of populism, I think, probably even up through today, is, is freedom from, from de- uh, creditors. Yeah, the fight becomes, you know, and Young was you know, in favor of the debtor class, and the fight becomes kind of between the creditor class and the debtor class. Where, you know, once you're so far in debt, you know, the only people with actual money were these kind of merchants or these these richer people, and then they would charge exorbitant rates. And if you wanted to grow your grow your farm or grow your artisan business or whatever, you had to borrow that money. But sooner but sooner or later, uh, you would end up, you know, either largely working for your, you know, you're working for your for your creditor. And or your creditor ends up taking your farm on foreclosure, and now you're you're a tenant farmer, or you're a hired hand, and you're just less and less free, less and less able to move about. The the ideology of the time among the sort of Whig elites was that you know that they didn't think about the liberty issue there. They thought of the liberty issue as they you know they would defend their right to to uh, pursue their commercial ends um, to the death because that's how they that's how they construed liberty. But so the idea of any any laws that would you know, that would help the, the debtor class seem to them contrary to liberty. But of course, the people in the debtor class, were, their liberty was constantly being squeezed and strangled by the creditor class. So this this is the warfare that sort of the social warfare and the economic warfare, the class warfare mm-hmm. um, that sort of prevails going into the into the, the imperial crisis with England, there's this like local class war going on. And this is exactly what got acted out in Pennsylvania is common cause made between people who really were on the debtor side and people on the creditor side kind of getting together to, uh, mm-hmm. to turn Pennsylvania for independence. But then of course you have a, you have a conflict because the creditor class still doesn't want to give up its power. And the debtor class is hoping that with independence, the debtor class can kind of take, take power. Um, and so that, that struggle goes on after July 4th, <laughs> 1776, uh, and defines a lot of the we- or rest of American history. One thing I wanted to ask about is, What's happening militarily here at the time? And as you say, not not much in general. But there there's one thing you've mentioned, which is uh, the king recruiting Hessians, German mercenary troops, uh, which caused a lot of outrage. And the other is uh, the HMS Roebuck. Yes, the right? Men of Wars. <laughs> That's yeah, a funny story. Which is a, a very modern sounding event yes. where um, Adams realizes ah, we can yes. win by losing. Yes. We can get, because I, I, in preparation for this show, I looked up the history of the HMS Roebuck, and this is by a, you know, a, a British war buff, and uh, he, I'm guessing it's a he, that's a pretty safe guess, um, writes this article um, boasting about how many captures the Roebuck made in American shipping at the time and what a successful campaign it had, and I'm reading it from your perspective, thinking that's not how it works in insurgency terms. You may have captured X number of ships or, you know, killed X number of communists or whatever, but uh, that was a big loss. Mm-hmm. 
Well, yeah, that's right. It's like, uh, yeah, that it is. It, it is in certain terms. It was a great victory for the Adamses that the Roebuck then, you know, started moving up the Delaware River um, right at the moment. I mean, this is, you know, Samuel Adams did not have magical powers, obviously. So there was a lot of luck involved in some of these things. And right when they lost that election that we were talking about earlier, which was like the referendum in a way on independence, and it turned out the people weren't, the voters weren't going to go for independence. Very fortunately, right after that, uh, they get the news about the Hessian mercenaries. And at the same, the same week, I think, um, yes. the Roebuck, which was a British, a uh, British ship, uh, guarding the mouth of the Delaware, because, you know, this was, it, it, the war was sort of in a, a static state, but, um, it was a state of war. And the Roebuck was there to make, to sort of blockade and make sure, you know, nothing was going in and out of, of the port of Philadelphia. Um, well, the Roebuck, the captain of the Roebuck started moving up the Delaware toward Philadelphia. Uh, he needed water and other supplies and uh, not just him, but I think there were a couple of tenders along and it was a pretty, it was a pretty noticeable thing on the, along the Delaware to see this giant, you know, man of war coming up the river, British man of war coming up the river toward Philadelphia. And of course the Patriots had watchers out there along the river and they're passing the news back and forth. And, um, this is like the best. And there was actually a bit of a battle. I mean, it's really mm-hmm. a declaration. It's like almost the only warfare I think that happens in that book. <laughs> um, it's a funny and story it's, too. But, yeah, it's, yeah, it gets grounded it's briefly for, and, for John yeah. Adams. He's in the Congress, saying, you know, he's just getting out. Look at this. I mean, you, you're telling me we're going to have reconciliation with these people. Look, here comes this man of war <laughs> right up toward our cap, right where we're meeting right here. This is like the best thing that yeah. could have happened. And that's the thing. Like the, the, I don't think the captain of the Roebuck was thinking about it one way or the other. I think he just had his particular supply needs. But these things kind of come together in a, in a funny way, um, where really. The, yeah, again, it's the propaganda war is being won uh, by the Adamses at that moment. Yeah, there's this yeah. quote here by Samuel Adams. He's um, a- after this event. It's on May 6th. And he sees the usefulness of it, and he says, um, quoting from your book, one battle would do more toward a declaration of independency than a long chain of conclusive arguments. <laughs> yeah, a great exactly. Line. And yeah. That's, I mean, that's so true, yeah. of course. It's always and there's true. Nothing about They're arguing and arguing have... in Congress. Yeah. Yeah, there's nothing about Sorry, we have to win. On the contrary, like, um, if we lose, that's good, yeah. you know, because it makes the invading force look even more all powerful, all like the oppressive juggernaut. I mean, as you say, a, a British ship of the line moving up uh, a coastal waterway toward a major city is a classic counterinsurgency move that's going to backfire badly yes. because it's that massive show of force uh, contrasted with the local people who are lightly armed. And it just drives home the fact that that you have this superiority of force, you're alien, and instantly you're in the wrong. Yeah, and it unifies, you know, always, it unifies resistance. Mm-hmm. I mean, the you know, I don't think the captain was even trying to intimidate. I think that was just an accident, sort <laughs> yeah. of. But, like, if anyone thought that was going to intimidate anybody, it's the it always has the opposite effect, right? I mean, now everyone's really mad. And now everyone's getting together against the common enemy, even the people who might have been on the fence or been reconciliated. And the reconciliationist arguments start to look empty. Like he's yeah. he's hired German mercenaries, and now here comes this ship. What are you talking about when you say reconciliation? <laughs> right, right. So now we get back to um, how they how they fought it. Uh, how how Adams and you know their little cabal meeting secretly. How they decide. How they overturned. Um, the Pennsylvania legislature. And I don't know, is it, I mean, is it too, is it too murky detail? I mean, I'm, I'm, I try to think, how would I summarize this? Basically, they uh, tabled a resolution to Congress that would make Dickinson and the reconciliationists look bad. Uh, the resolution says, if you don't like your government, you know, get a new government, essentially. And Dickinson realizes, well, everybody likes our government here, so I'll vote for this resolution. This doesn't hurt me. And then he agrees to it, and the Adams, you know, kind of fume over that. And then Dickinson, because I guess he's not healthy or we don't know why, then leaves town, and that gives the Adams an opportunity to push forward another, uh, a preamble, which which basically makes it treason to have... Uh, I mean, it's it's in a big attack on the on the king and on on anybody taking a royal oath on any government that takes a royal oath, and it kind of corners people like Dickinson and the reconciliation is more. Am I 
Am I saying that right? I'm not sure. Yeah, I mean, the the, the day-to-day blow-by-blow kind of politics of it are in the book, and yeah. – and, uh, I, I wouldn't, you know, it would take us a long time yeah. probably for me to go over it the, yeah. minute to minute. But I would say, you know, the, the battle was fought. What, what's interesting about it to me is just, again, you know, I mean, the idea that that the, the Pennsylvania government suddenly becomes considered illegitimate in right. John Adams's terms because they take oaths to the king was just another made up propaganda thing where, right. you know, other other governments also took oaths to the king. But but what what what's really going on kind of broad stroke is that. John and Samuel Adams are using the Congress and congressional resolutions to kind of pound on Pennsylvania's government, which is literally in the same building as them meeting upstairs. Because remember, you know, we have to remember that this is all happening in Pennsylvania. The host government itself is the one that's under attack. Mm -hmm. Um, And so that the Pennsylvania Assembly has Dickinson's Assembly has moved upstairs to give the Continental Congress its regular meeting room. That's what that meeting room is. The place we call Independence Hall is the Pennsylvania State House. Right. Um, So the government upstairs is meeting and 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 Adams is trying to um, destroy it downstairs. And what they're doing is kind of beating on it with congressional resolutions. Meanwhile, their allies out in the street, uh, Thomas Paine, Thomas Young, James Cannon, these people we've been talking about, are galvanizing the the populace to say, okay, Congress is going to support us in overthrowing our elected government. So it's a series of maneuvers that involves, you know, a lot of sort of a lot of really tricky, very tricky, very slippery moves. Um, in, including what you've just said, like passing a resolution in Congress that's supposed to like dismantle Pennsylvania's government, but Dickinson's too smart for that. He says, "Oh, well, I, I'm happily to sign. I'll happily sign on to this resolution because my, my the government of Pennsylvania. We just had an election. It's a working government. It's no problem. It doesn't apply to me." Then, strangely, he leaves town, and John Adams comes in with an, a, a, a preamble to that resolution, which is like ten times as long as the resolution yes, itself, yes. which against again just tries to shove Pennsylvania yeah. back into the purview of the resolution, making its government illegitimate. Dickinson wasn't there for reasons unknown. I mean, it was probably his biggest strategic error of his career was just to leave town at that moment. Maybe he thought he'd triumphed over them. Maybe he was ill. It's it's hard to know. Um, It it sounds uh, like Danton at at that crucial moment of the French Revolution. You know, you've mentioned its health. And one of the things you find in insurgencies is that their physical trials as as well as uh, political and mental trials, and eventually some people just break, you know, and, and they they just can't handle it anymore. And victory goes to the bloody minded or slightly crazy or obsessive who never yeah. break. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah, I, he he came back and did try to fight to keep his government in power. There's this weird long limbo period after that, but. But I, I don't know. It might have been the health thing. It might have been that he broke. I also think maybe he was overconfident that he had played it so well that there was nothing else they could do, which would have been dumb because, you know, John Adams wasn't going to give up. He came in with that preamble, and it's just a classic Adams thing. It's just a sweaty, overly loud, complicated, <laughs> please, pummeling, pummeling, you know. Yeah. Just, and he doesn't care if he looks stupid. Like, he doesn't care if people make fun of him. He pushed it through. And so now suddenly... The, the, the street gets the news. Oh, the Congress has just said that the Pennsylvania's government's illegitimate. So now, so then the, the street is primed through this sort of uh, cabal to like to to have a and they end up having a mass meeting and base outside the state house and basically just all mass, not through any like normal procedure, shouting down the government of Pennsylvania, just like just saying no, we're not going to listen to this government anymore. And then the armed militias that James Cannon had been organizing throughout the entire state, the Committee of Privates, these are the unpropertied and less propertied people, the working class, but they're armed because there's this war coming potentially, this invasion coming. The very very security of the of the colony to, or the, the province depends on these peoples being armed, they uh, just started to decline to take orders from, from Dickinson's assembly. So there was there were a series of really adroitly done and sometimes not so adroitly in the end effectively done moves on all levels uh, by this kind of strange alliance, this sort of devil's deal alliance of populists and elitists to just make it impossible for Dickinson to function. I mean, he just could not function in the end. Uh, and the duly elected government of the colony could not function in the end. That's what they did. They didn't, you know, you know, when Samuel Adams was right, you know, argument after argument after argument, we can argue forever, but ultimately we have to actually take action. 
and uh, Pennsylvania was overwhelmed by acts, a series of political and and while it was bloodless, ultimately a military coup on the part right, of they, the, they uh, brought the armed, armed militias. Class. Yeah, they brought armed militias into the street. It's, uh, and yeah, yeah. That that's another feature that doesn't get covered much no. in the sort of uh, Aristotelian version of the Declaration. No, no, it doesn't. <laughs> And 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 Thomas Paine plays a role in this, and we know his name. We don't. I still say, we, you know, and and common sense. We know the name of his pamphlet, but I don't think unless you get really into him, we know much about him. He's quite radical, and gets even more radical after this period. I mean, this he's you know uh, uh, anti-slavery. He's against the the mistreatment of Indians both in India and in the Empire and in America. He uh, becomes. Um, uh, he allies with the feminists. He's for full suffrage, all these things. But in 1776, um, I guess so, John Adams, <laughs> I love your quote here. I mean, again, you've talked about this strange bedfellows, how these elitists, the Adams, um, have to make common cause with Thomas Young and Thomas Paine. And you say here, um, of all the people John Adams hated, and in 1776, uh, that list was already long, he may have hated Thomas Paine most of all. <laughs> I love that line. Yeah. And, and yeah. Uh, some of his descriptions, this is um, John Adams' descriptions of Thomas Paine. He calls him a star of disaster, which is, uh, uh, means a meteor that leaves a crater. Um, uh, calls his books worthless and unprincipled, profligate and impious. Calls common sense a poor, ignorant, malicious, short-sighted, crapulous mass. <laughs> yeah, I love that. That's my, one of my favorite uh, Adams uh, quotes. Crapulous. Crapulous. Payne had some remarks about back. Adams. Too. Yeah, we're bringing yeah, back crapulous. crapulous. Yes, it's it's. You know, not... it means I had to look it up when I first read that. I didn't know what it meant, but no, it actually just means like it means just blind, sodden, drunk. <laughs> oh, wow! And Adams uh, did. Uh, Payne did. I, I think have up his his ups and downs with the bottle, and I think Adams just. <laughs> but Adams again just just painting him in the broadest terms is like just a total <laughs> drunk, a drunkard, you know, as if this is what, you know, I mean, and, uh, you know, uh, pain too. He really hated Adams I'm as well, sure. of course. Yeah. And, uh, had some remarks to he made. He, he was, he was less, he was a great, a better writer really, but his remarks about Adam, are just sort of like, Oh, poor John. He was not born for greatness. <laughs> and, uh, that would hurt John more well, than anything. Right. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. They would hurt him more. Yeah. Exactly. Oh, uh, I think of another one if while I'm talking maybe, but yeah, the, the pain piece of this is important because pain really was a radical like Thomas Young. He was a genuine social and economic radical in favor of giving, um, giving unproperty people the vote. And actually he goes farther than many because I've, I always mention the sort of white male nature of this radicalism, but Payne was friends with Mary Wollstonecraft and, you know, he ends up, I um, mean, it's a terror. It's a, after this, he, you know, he really helped bring about the revolution in Pennsylvania that tipped the balance to bring about independence. And then he's with George Washington in the field. And he really had love. He just, he just, you know, hero worshiped Washington. His writings about Washington really constructed Washington as a great leader, which hmm. was by no means apparent at all at the time Payne was writing about it. And then he wrote, you know, he wrote, you know, he wrote, he wrote this kind of really brilliant propaganda just about trying to bring the country together against England when we were losing the war. But he ends up, I mean, his radicalism never went away and he ended up, he went, he was back in England. Um, he was, he fled England because he was going to be arrested for sedition there. He ends up in the French, you know, in, in the French revolution, in the French government. Right. Um, he doesn't speak French and he has an interpreter and he, and he runs afoul of the most radical elements of the French revolution and ends up in, the, uh, in prison in, in Paris. Um, he's going to be guillotined because he's trying to, he's, he's actually, he actually argued against cutting off the king's head because his point, Payne's point was, you know, he's, if you cut off his head, he, then he's still the king. Like, let's, right. you know, mm. let's, let's just send him to America, name him like Mr. Somebody, take away his title. Payne's thing was like, there are no kings, God damn yeah. it, you know, but so, so don't cut off his head. Um, yeah, but that, that made him seem counter-revolutionary. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can all, yeah, if you get too sophisticated, it's very e easy to be called counter-revolutionary. You, you get that with exactly. uh, a certain kind of um, stone-faced Bolshevik later on. Yep, it's like yep. uh, you're, you're being too subtle, and subtle is bad. Especially when you're a foreigner right, who doesn't right. speak the language. It's, it's elitist to yeah. be, you know, thinking in a nuanced way. And 
Uh, yeah, so he was called counter-revolutionary, arrested and put in prison, and he he uh, he asserted his his U.S. citizenship as <laughs> a way of trying to. Uh, but by then, all of the elites in the U.S. Uh, wanted to dissociate themselves of course, from Payne because he he'd become this French revolutionary. I mean, Washington. The story of Washington and Payne is just one of the most painful. Uh, no pun intended. But he uh, he uh, he he would send Washington like crates full of his books, his radical books, and you know Washington was just trying to forget about. Him at this point. I mean, so actually, they refused to acknowledge the, the French minister, the minister to France, Gouverneur Morris, uh, refused to acknowledge Payne as an American citizen. Um, I can't you know, help imagining this as a Bugs Bunny cartoon. I know. Pain in the Bastille <laughs> going, Santa for the red, white, <laughs> yeah, and yeah, the American yeah, going, yeah. no, sorry, I don't know him. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, I don't know that. Who's that guy again? Uh, yeah, I think I remember him, sort of, but I don't think he's one of us. No, no, you know. It's a very picaresque. Yeah, it really, it's brutal. It's brutal. Very picaresque story. <laughs> Classic. Yeah. So, uh, so. On May twentieth, um, essentially, the, there's a essentially like a, a working class coup. The the committee of privates and the mob stop the newly elected assembly from forming, denounce them, and disassemble them, and call for a new convention and a new vote in June. And that brings Pennsylvania around to the pro independence, and eventually the states around it. And so the convention calling for the full declaration of independence, or the Congress, I mean is set for July 1st and 2nd, right? That's that's when they're actually argue yeah. and then debate. They and the then, resolution. Yeah. There was a resolution for independence brought in by the Virginia allies of the Adamses, uh, Richard Henry Lee in particular, who I focus on less in uh, in, in declaration, but I do some backstory on him and his, him and Washington and Jefferson and the Virginia patriots in Autumn of the Black Snake. Um, yes. Because it was this yeah, oddball they, they alliance. Form a, between, yeah, they form a sort of gentleman dilettante uh punitive militia basically <laughs> yeah it's uh, and they were really they were really they became patriots in 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 um in defense of their of their right to you know expand into the west and get indian land basically um and they so they, there's this weird alliance another strange bedfellow alliance between the virginia patriots like J richard henry lee and and uh, the Samuel Adams massachusetts patriots who really didn't have a lot in common but they did have in common this these, these ideas about liberty, these ideas about English rights, even though they interpreted them pretty differently, like Richard Henry Lee wanted to get you know, land policy in Virginia into the hands of his of his cohort, George Washington and his and Patrick Henry's kind of investment cohort. And, uh, you know, Samuel Adams wanted to turn Massachusetts into a Christian Sparta. So their goals were different. But again, you have this sort of strange alliance among people who, with differing goals. And so Richard Henry Lee really brought in the resolution for independence. It was a Virginia resolution written by him and Patrick Henry and others. Patrick Henry was down in Virginia trying to get rid of the, the, the political enemies there. Um, so they bring in this resolution and they table it uh, until in the end, until uh, early, early, the very beginning of July. Uh, so we're now we're now we're coming up to the actual thing itself. Right. And this is right around the time that this huge armada, as you said, the largest in English history um, is its invasion is is just starting to happen of America, or it's you know, to retake. Right, America, so right. it coincides with the British invasion, right? I mean, the British are coming into they're coming into New York Harbor. I mean, the descriptions at the time are like you couldn't see any. It was like like a forest. The masts looked like a fo an actual forest. It was that many ships. Mm. Um, Admiral Howe is coming in. Uh, of course, he's hoping to negotiate still. Howe right. was sort of a the Howe brothers were kind of Americanist, and they were sort of sympathetic to the Americans' position. And they thought maybe they still thought maybe they could negotiate. Right. Meanwhile, in, in Philadelphia, they're declaring independence, which is going to make it impossible to negotiate. Right. Yeah, they were kind of surprised. They show up in Staten Island thinking, OK, we'll sit down, have some tea and settle this. And they find out they've already declared independence. And I mean, yeah, you, you, another, you, another just random sort of let, I mean, the Howes are like, let's, you know, let's uh, OK, let's work this out. We don't have, yeah. to have this war. And oh, what did you do? You did, oh, you know, idiots. Now we have to this war. <laughs> I mean, it was only days. It was like literally it's happening all at the same time. Uh, uh, well, really, once again, I, 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 have to, I just have to say that no, no colony of the empire was treated so gently 
to my yeah, knowledge, that's a great example anytime, of that, yeah. anywhere. It's astonishing. <laughs> it's true because the house had, had they had they had very limited negotiating instructions, but they were willing to even on their own try to go beyond their instructions to get a deal and become the peacemakers. So yeah, that's another great example of the thing you were talking about earlier. This. This, there was this strong pro-American feeling on the part of many British elites, even at the t- still, and t- and t- right through. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, I, I remember is, Samuel is. Johnson was ostracized by the London literary community for writing anti-American propaganda because so <laughs> many of, of the uh, literary professionals in London were supporters of the American Revolution. Mm. Yeah, and there were people in in uh, in, in Parliament, in Commons, and in, in Parliament, just making these impassioned pro-American arguments. So yeah, I mean that goes right back to the thing you were talking about before. It's pretty interesting. I mean, the Howes would have tried to make peace, uh, but that was not to be. But in because a, of what was going on in Philadelphia. One other lesson I get from your book too is that. Um, I mean, for counterinsert, let's say you you look at this through British eyes, I. It seem like there are only really two counterinsurgency strategies that can work. One is the Roman, Mongol, British Empire way, which is completely lay waste and kill everyone and, and exterminate and so on, um, th- which they weren't going to do. And the other one is don't, don't do anything um, because every little thing they did – and by British imperial standards, they were pretty little, whether it was the Boston Massacre or, or this uh, HMS Roebuck going up the Delaware River and mm-hmm. firing on. Or with in Virginia's case, I mean, here you you know you have a, a colony, a state that's, that is really run by an aristocracy. But, but they did a lot to piss them off and alienate them by um, what Lord Dunmore, the former governor, uh, took the side of the, of the British and then said any slave who... Um, joins our side, we'll, we'll ensure that they're free afterwards. Well, that was as much of a declaration of war on the elites as anything imaginable. And then they also bombarded Norfolk. So it, it, that didn't help at all by doing a kind of a, even tiny steps towards shows of force and, and half-assed war. All it did was galvanize the resistance and radicalize the Americans. And it seems to me you either you either go in and exterminate, as the Brits did so many other places, or you, you just really shouldn't do anything in this case. I'm trying to draw some lessons yeah. here. I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> yeah well, that was, that, yeah. <laughs> kill them with kindness or yeah. kill them. Yeah. Uh, don't, above all, don't annoy them. And that maxim yes. goes at least back to Machiavelli. Like, uh, if you're going to repress people, go in hard, quickly, and do it all at once. Don't pester them don't <laughs> annoy them yeah yeah that's the right word yeah yeah like a, sh- a shelling here or there yeah. or an adventurous little exploration over the- all that does is have the opposite effect i mean it's yeah. just- Seems like a lesson that should have been learned by now, maybe. I know. I mean, that that obviously (laughs) is very applicable to the American Empire and all of our, yeah. Uh, Yeah, no lessons learned around here. But we've kept you on for a long time, and and we'd better better let you go. But thank you so much. This is amazing stuff. I've never really seen the American Revolution treated as an insurgency before. And when you see it that way, a lot of it makes a great deal of sense. Yep. Yes. Well, that's good to know. <laughs> it's good to know. Because the more I look at this stuff, sometimes the less sense it makes to me. So, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it's, it's, if you guys are seeing lessons. That, also, well, you have there, the bigger picture. You have the broader picture that, you know? Well, there's one, there's one anomaly, and that's the, the mildness of the empire. But the rest of it is all pretty standard. Yeah, I guess it's kind of classic. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank you again for, uh, for joining us and for, um, you know, making us understand allowing us to understand much better what happened around the, the July 4th Declaration of Independence. In fact, we should finish off by saying what actually finally happened with that, and then we'll let you go if you don't mind. Um, they, there was a, they, on July 2nd, they passed the re- resolution for independence, and then they passed on to a, a small committee of five people um, the job of writing up this Declaration of Independence on which jo- Thomas Jefferson sat Right. And Jefferson winds up being the only guy with time on his hands. So he winds up writing the whole thing. Um, yeah, that, that committee had been formed before kind of an anticipation uh, uh, of the potential for actually passing that resolution on the second. But of course, the second is really the day the, that America became independent. Right. Because that's the resol- the, resol- the vote on the resolution. And it was very it was still touch and go right till the end. You know, this is the other thing. It's like right. if, if it hadn't. 
uh, in the in the sort of straw poll type voting or committee of the whole voting or whatever they did to sort of see how it was going to go. It still wasn't unanimous. And, you know, you're looking – these guys have to be looking at each other from these desks like, well, if we don't have a unanimous vote on this, we're, it's a civil war. I mean, yes. what's going to happen, you know? Um, so it was it was a very near thing. And the only reason it really worked is that Dickinson finally just realized he had no he couldn't he couldn't contribute to American disunity by by he, he stayed home. And the way they voted was so strange and people can read about it in the book. But like they didn't vote exactly in blocks uh, so right. that Dickinson staying home and just not voting uh, was really the thing that that made it seem like a unified effort. It's still the disunity they, they papered over there was still quite great, but finally they pulled it off. So that was really the, the big event uh, for the nation or the, the nation that was to be the big event for the, for the union or the Confederation of States was, uh, was on the second. And of course there's a second climax, which I'll just slip in here, <laughs> which is that of course, Pennsylvania really was overturned. There's that there are two revolutions um, and Pennsylvania really was overturned and the populists really did take over Pennsylvania also. And then the declaration itself, you know, the declaration itself was like it, not the most important thing at the time. That's right. The other thing, it, be, it has become fetishized over the years. But uh, the, the, the resolution on the second was the important thing. The declaration was a press release, more or less, mm -hmm. to sort of tell people what happened on the second and why it was legitimate, not to become a founding document. It's only mm -hmm. really later that it became considered one of our founding documents, like on a parallel with the Constitution in some way. Right. It was just an attempt to tell France and Holland and other countries, you know, we are now independent. We have a legitimate basis for our independence based on the tyranny of the king. And now we're going to come to you for, you know, for financial and military support. Um, it was never considered by anyone until later to be an, uh, a critically important document. Right. I think you write in your book that, um, so on the committee, the, the most Famous people on that committee of five who were supposed to write it were Thomas Jefferson, Ben Franklin, who was kind of old and out of it, and John Adams, who was busy doing 20 different things, so he didn't have much to do with it either. And it, and then later, as it started to become more of a famous document, um, he both denigrated it as basically like what you see, like a press, you know, a glorified press release, but also tried taking credit for it. Am I, if I remember that right, is that? Do you mean uh, Adams? Adams, Adams yeah, yeah. I think you yeah. wrote that. Yeah, I think he always had mixed feelings because as right. later it became, you know, Adam Jefferson didn't want to work on it either. He wanted to go back to Virginia and work right. on the Virginia Constitution. I mean, this is where the action really was uh, for these for a lot of these people was in writing their own constitutions. And, um, but but uh, Adams, I think the fact that it then later became a famous document and was then became this kind of um, you know holy writ and so forth. Then Adams had mixed feelings about the fact that he hadn't really authored it. So he just went back and forth all his life, you know, sometimes saying it wasn't that important, other times saying that he was partly behind it, um, you know. So it, Jefferson... it was nothing special, and if it was, I wrote it. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah, that's very John. <laughs> um, uh, Jefferson went around because, you know, they, as far as he was concerned, they butchered it in in, in the committee of the whole and rewrote it. Right. He, he went around the rest of his life for like carrying around his original copy of it and showing it to people like the real, his idea of what the real declaration was, was his first draft. They took so out all a the lot of, parts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there was a lot. I mean, every writer can relate to that, yes. but it was, it was, uh, it was, it, it was a very, it became a very emotionally fraught thing. Whereas originally it started as like, Oh, someone's got to write a declaration to sort of <laughs> clarify what we're doing here. You know, that's kind of incredible though, that, that one of the, parts that was edited out that he even wrote this was where he blames the slave trade on the king. Like we would never have, yeah. uh, here he is with his own slave. I, I know the hypocrisy thing is it's, it's an old story, but, but the fact that he would even bring it up is kind of radical too. Yeah. And that's why I think they took it out just because cooler heads were like, you know, that's just not going to look good. I mean, no one's going to believe that, <laughs> that we're going to blame this whole trade on the, yeah. on the king. I mean, for, coming from Virginia, that's, <laughs> um, yeah so yeah there's a, there were a lot of moments like that i think i think he but i think he really did feel like that they had taken out the best parts and put in some stupid parts and he wanted everyone years later he would want people to see his original L last thing i i uh, was listening to an interview on chuck mertz's on this is hell uh with somebody who wrote, i think she wrote a book a, a woman who wrote a book about american anxiety i want to say it was and she, 
if I remember this right, anyway, she got into the history of the line, uh, the pursuit of happiness, because usually they would say life, liberty, and property. I think that was even a a preamble in the Virginia Constitution that the planters made sure they put in. And Jefferson kind of came up with that little inno innovation instead of property, the pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And she said that he put that in specifically to troll the British, that it was meant to kind of put a bug up their asses because uh, because of their reputation for being grim and cheerless. Um, I don't know if that rings a bell with anything there. Wow. I know. That's, uh, that's <laughs> interesting. I've never heard that. Yeah. In Autumn of the Black Snake, my new book, which is just out, um, I deal directly with the question of what Jefferson might have meant by pursuit of happiness. Mm. And I'm, I'm thinking about it in terms of um, – his view of, of of property ownership and the idea that and and the idea that not only uh, is there an absolute right to own property freely not not under tenure from a sovereign but actually if you found it it's yours um which is a, a was a wild idea to the british um mm -hmm. but also is, is is sort of a corollary of that of important corollary is that you know in this sort of rights of englishmen thing this sort of natural rights of englishmen thing you have this right to move into new territories yeah um leave where you might have been you know born by chance and go to where you choose to go and any land you find there that that's uninhabited or whatever you can um you can make that your own too, and that the the monarch would have no would have no say in that area. The sovereign has no say in that area. Well, the backstory to that has to do with Virginia speculation and what was then considered the Western country, which was Indian country. So um, I think I think he's very specifically referring there when he says pursuit of happiness. He's making sure that people understand that he's referring also to the to the freedom to move. Which the British, of course, were restricting those Virginia speculators right. in their in their real estate ventures with the Indians. Yeah, no, I, I, your your explanation makes a lot more sense. It's kind of grim, but it's, it makes more we sense. We all have to speculate about yeah. what he meant, but yeah. I think there's, I, I think I can make a case that there's a good argument yeah. that he was yeah. talking about this idea of moving into new lands uh, and holding them free of free of sovereign right. restriction. Right. Okay, good. So on that note, uh, we'll finish up. We've kept you a long time. And thank you again for an, uh, a great uh, interview and great Yeah, thank you episode. very much. That was great. Yeah. All right. Thank you, guys. It's always fun. Okay. Take care. Happy Love. 4th of July. Happy 4th of oh, July. Oh, yeah, you too. Happy 2nd of July. <laughs> That's why. Well, you know. Actually, yes. Today's the real one. Today's, today's the real one. one. Yeah. For us purists. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> for us purists. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. All right. Bye, Bill. All right. Thanks. Thanks bye. again. Bye. Thank you.